Okay, welcome to class nine of the free BJCP prep course offered to you by barleypotmaker.info. Today we're going to be covering the basics of yeast and fermentation. Um, once again, this course is brought to you, you know, free of charge. It is not um, endorsed by the BJCP, but I do have permission from the education director to put this um, to put this out there. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to give you some. Uh, links at the end uh, that you can uh, contact me. I did have a question come through by email asking why we're covering all of this information about hops and yeast and malt and things like that when the judging exam pretty much covers how to fill out a score sheet and or requires how to fill out a score sheet and troubleshooting. Um, and the reason that I'm covering all of this is because this course is also intended to help people prepare for the entrance exam and also knowing a lot of this basic information if you don't already know it uh, will help you with troubleshooting and giving feedback to uh, an entrant to help them correct their beer if you know you know uh, the differences between uh, what what a decoction mash can add to a beer you can offer that up as a suggestion so that's why we're going through all of all of these steps and if you've noticed we started with just basic water and we moved into to malts and hops and we basically have built a beer um, all the way you know the various stages we've built a beer and now we're finishing out on this section with yeast and fermentation so let's get started and talk a little bit about yeast and fermentation and we're going to talk about Saccharomyces or this is our yeast. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae or the ale yeast is going to be um, the main grouping or the main family for all of the ale yeast uh, substrains and Saccharomyces pastorianus or the lager yeast strain. This um, strain is also sometimes referred to as Saccharomyces carlsbergensis and that is um, the old world name for the the lager yeast. Um, some people still call it that but the modern terminology is Saccharomyces pastorianus. Um, the, mainly they differ in their optimum fermentation temperatures, their ability to ferment different sugars, uh, their environmental tolerances which we're going to cover a little bit later, um, the ability to settle out or flocculation, and the production and or ability to metabolize byproducts will vary between these two main families of yeast. Um, the main one that we're going to, that, that you're going to be concerned about is going to be um, optimum fermentation temperature or the environmental tolerances of each yeast. There are many, many strains from each family or species of, of yeast. You know, if you've done any amount of brewing, you know that there's uh, many different types of ale yeast. You know, you have the Cal Ale yeast, you have uh, London Ale, and, and even within, say, the European yeast strains, you have, um, I mean, between the British yeast strains, you'll have several different um, strains in there as well, just like you have, you know, the Cal Ale yeast, you have Cal, Cal Ale 4 and 5, and, you know, there's just so many different ale and lager strains you, it's hard to keep them all straight so good thing we have charts for that but they basically break down into these two large families now we're going to talk a little bit about attenuation um, apparent attenuation is the ability for a, a yeast strain to decrease the original gravity of wort through fermentation in order in other words converting sugar to alcohol this is commonly listed as a percent. If you look at your yeast um, packets or if you look at a yeast data sheet, you will see an attenuation percentage. And generally what that means is that is the percentage of sugars that the yeast can uh, convert to alcohol. Um, in order to figure this out, uh, the attenuation is the difference between final and original gravities. So for example, if a yeast strain is listing as having an 80% attenuation capability, that means the yeast can consume 80% of the sugars produced in an optimum environment. You know, you may not always get that 80%, but that is best case scenario usually for attenuation of that yeast strain. If you get any higher attenuation than that, you, you've either gone outside of the recommended fermentation temperatures or you have another uh, species at play as well. 
Um, attenuation, uh, ethanol, which is the alcohol that's produced through fermentation, is less dense than water. And uh, using a hydrometer, we can measure apparent attenuation between you know the differences of um, how much sugar. So your your liquid is going to be more dense uh, before fermentation because of all that sugar. And then as the yeast can c consume that sugar, they produce alcohol. Alcohol is lighter um, in density than water, so you end up with that gra that gravity of that beer reducing down. And that measurement is between the differences is attenuation. Um, is, is if you noticed earlier, I called this apparent attenuation. There's another type of attenuation called real attenuation. And real attenuation would be measured if the sugar was actually replaced by water instead of by alcohol. And if the byproduct of fermentation was water instead of alcohol, you would have real attenuation. Um, I did contact White Labs and uh, Y Yeast, and they confirmed that the attenuation that they list is apparent attenuation and not real attenuation. Real attenuation uh, involves a whole different type of measuring system, and uh, it sounds like it's a lot more difficult, but you can get a real or apparent attenuation reading uh, with uh, yeast, and um, mostly what they use is apparent so that's kind of important to know just for your own personal your own personal knowledge I've I've often heard beginning brewers refer to flocculation and they'll use it in terms of attenuation so flocculation is sometimes uh, mistaken by new brewers as attenuation so I just want to point out if you are a new brewer that flocculation only describes the yeast's ability to clump together and settle out after fermentation is complete. Attenuation is the measure of um, how much your yeast has fermented out that sugar. And then to calculate uh, apparent attenuation you want to use the following formula. If you use brewing software you don't really have to know this and um, unless you're taking the written exam for the BJCP exam uh, you may not even need this um, unless you're gonna figure out you know your your attenuation of your uh, of the yeast and part of your recipe to try to get a few extra points you don't really need to know this um, but I included it because some people like to know that stuff if they want to build their own spreadsheet so this is the formula for coming up with apparent attenuation and here's an example of how the formula would work. So I can give you just a minute to to look through that. I'm not going to read through. It's just a bunch of numbers. And it's kind of boring, but that is how attenuation would would be figured out. Environmental condition. Different different strains can tolerate different conditions. This is something that you really need to know. You know, not every yeast, even not every ale yeast strain, will have the same temperature optimum temperature range they'll they'll usually be pretty close but it's not always going to be the same they're not going to like the same environmental conditions you know some yeast in order to get the the esters that you want from them they might prefer a warmer fermentation or if this ale yeast strain is generally considered fairly clean you may be a little bit on the lower end of the scale so different yeast tolerate different conditions um, as far as alcohol tolerance goes most lagers Lager yeast can withstand up to 8% alcohol by volume uh, percentages. Uh, some ale strains, uh, um, except for the, the specialty, very high gravity specialty ale yeast, your average ale yeast can withstand a maximum of up to 12% alcohol by volume. Um, yeast will always have an oxygen requirement of some sort, whether it's during your... Um, building phase if you're going to be doing a yeast starter um, they're always going to need oxygen for reproduction so they're they're always going to have an oxygen requirement aeration is more more important than many brewers happen to um, acknowledge and I think part of that comes into play you know it comes from when you're starting out and people tell you you know just like when we covered in water where they say if your water is good enough to drink it's good enough to brew with well that that's true and some people will say you know with aeration you don't have to do it because uh, 
your yeast will ferment anyway. But just like with water, yeah, you, you can you can brew with it and, and your beer might turn out good. But if you want to start reaching the, the excellent range or you want to have a world-class beer, you're going to have to start paying attention to the way that your water tastes and the components in your water. If you want to end up with world-class beer, you're going to have to start paying attention at some point to your aeration. Um, because you want to get enough oxygen in the early phases of fermentation to ensure that you're going to have a healthy yeast, you're going to have uh, fewer off flavors with a good aeration, and you're going to have a more full attenuation because the yeast are going to be very healthy, they're going to have nice healthy cell walls, they're going to be, divide very cleanly, you're not going to have as much uh, mutation. So something you really need to consider if you want to up your game in brewing is some type of aeration uh, requirements. Wort composition is also another environmental condition. Uh, whether we're talking about the fermentability of the of the uh, of the wort, the ferment fermentability uh, will be dependent on the types of sugars produced during your mash and the type of yeast that will consume those sugars, um, because not all yeast consume exactly all of the same sugars. Generally, they do, but um, lagers can can tend to uh, fully ferment. Um, it's raffinose or something like that that they can fully ferment that that ale can't so um the differences in the simple and complex sugars will make a make a difference also uh the density of your work you know what the gravity is is going to have an impact on the beer so uh, wort composition is something that can affect the flavors given off by your yeast Everybody all knows about temperature, but temperature, whether it's too cold or too warm, can affect the flavors produced by the yeast, or whether or not your yeast are overly active, or if they're sluggish, or completely become inactive. So we're going to cover the, the basic temperature ranges for ales and lagers in the next slide, but temperature is another environmental condition uh, that can affect yeast. And remember, many off flavors are produced by a stressed yeast. Uh, we sometimes um, stress them on purpose, and sometimes it's unwanted. So be aware of these four requirements, you know, based on whatever particular yeast strain that you're using. And as long as you're paying attention to these four um, sections, you should you should do all right with your with your uh, fermentation. So. Ale yeast uh, generally works best between 55 degrees and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, or 12 to 24 degrees Celsius. Um, their apparent attenuation ranges anywhere from 69% to 80%. And ale yeast will fully ferment uh, glucose, fructose, maltose, sucrose, maltotriose, xylose, mannose, and galactose. Um, they will partially ferment raffinose. Um, I prefer to call ale yeast top cropping and not top fermenting. Um, yeast are suspended in, in solution. They're not just on the surface as, you know, when you say top fermenting, people are always thinking that the yeast are right up there on top fermenting your beer. They're actually throughout the entire solution. Um, but ale yeast does tend to form clumps that will... Um, be supported by the surface tension of the beer and you'll have more yeast clumps gathered usually right up on the top or sometimes even in your carousing so that's that's where the 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 uh, top fermenting um, comes from but it's not actually only fermenting at the top it's just you tend to have more yeast floating towards the top in clusters Ale yeast also tends to be slightly estery. Even even your more clean strains are always going to have some degree of estery capabilities, and uh, that's because they need the higher temperatures in order to be active. But esters at, in low levels are generally considered and and even sought after in many ale strains. Some special strains like the German Hefe yeast uh, generate high concentrations of desired phenols and esters. That's a, a good example. You know, another one would be uh, your wit beer or your Saison or your Belgian strains that um, generate high concentrations of phenols and esters and they're desired in your beer. If you uh, 
don't want those phenols and esters in your beer, then don't use those yeast strains. So lager yeast uh, generally works best uh, at 46 to 56 degrees Fahrenheit, that's or, or 7 to 14 degrees Celsius. That's the fermentation stage. That's not necessarily the lagering stage, um, but when they are actually doing all of the work that you want them to do, consuming the sugars, that is the temperature range that they tend to work best at. Um, some strains, like Cal California Common Lager Yeast and San Francisco Lager Yeast, can withstand warmer temperatures into the into the uh, low 60s, or, or roughly around 15 degrees Celsius. And those are very good yeast yeast strains to use for lagers that um, if you don't have good temperature control or an ability to uh, get down into the 40s and 50s consistently, you can use... Um, something like San Francisco lager yeast and still make like a pre-prohibition lager that is very clean and has some nice uh, malty lager characteristics to it. The apparent attenuation for lager yeast generally ranges anywhere from 67 to 77 percent. Uh, they ferment all the same sugars that um, ale yeast does but it also fully ferments raffinose and maltotriose. Um, the attenuation is a little bit lower because it may not consume all of the sugars that it is given, but it can ferment the same sugars that ale yeast does. Uh, lager yeast tends to not cling together like ale yeast and form clumps at the top, uh, so they do tend to fall more towards the bottom, which is why they are sometimes called bottom fermenting, but just like uh, the ale yeast, they're working throughout the entire uh, beer. They're they're fermenting at the top, the middle, the bottom. It's just uh, they tend to, to flocculate a little bit more. There are two subtypes of, of the lager yeast family. The Froberg types of lager yeast ferments quickly, uh, but it doesn't qu uh, flocculate quite so well. Um, it um, tends to be real powdery. Um, so due to the longer suspension, this... Uh, this can mean that you can, can get a little bit better attenuation with uh, Froberg types of lager yeast. Uh, the Saz type of lager yeast flocculates very well. This, it's a little bit um, more common to get the uh, Saz type of lager yeast, uh, but you, you do get a little bit lower attenuation, but you get better clarity. And um, i just like to talk a little bit about, you know, where I mentioned here that it has a little bit lower attenuation. You know that's going to give you a little bit of a heavier beer, and the way uh, to really to prove that to people that always think that lagers are lighter than ales is you always think of uh, a black and tan, and say uh, you have the Harps Lager. You know traditionally you'll have the Harps Lager on the bottom, and then you put the spoon on top, and you pour your uh, Guinness Stout on top, and it floats. Well, if you think back to you know basic middle school chemistry, your lighter liquid always floats on top of the heavier, more dense liquid, and so that is a really good example of um, how the lagers tend to be a little bit lower attenuated than uh, some of the ales, the the more dry ales, and that that ale will actually sit on top of the lager. Uh, lagers tend to be a little et less estery because of the cooler temperatures. You know, cooler temperatures produce fewer esters. And um, esters are not really desirable in lagers. You want them to be fairly clean, so they sh showcase a little bit more of the hop and malt character without the yeast getting in the way very much in terms of flavor and aroma. We also sometimes during fermentation use bacterium and wild yeast. So yes, bacteria, but don't don't be scared. You know, if you are not familiar with sour or wild beers, uh, bacteria can be can be good. Uh, you can usually tell bacteria the name of a bacteria. Like if somebody says that they're fer they're going to ferment with uh, X Y Z, if it contains a Cillus, Coccus, or Bacter at the end of the name, that's usually some type of bacteria like Lactobacillus, Pedococcus, Acobacter. Those are all forms of bacteria. Um, generally, they're desired in sour and in some Belgian styles. Uh, some other styles, um, or most other styles, they are considered a fault. Um, 
Lactobacillus is probably the most common that you hear a lot of people using lacto, and it contributes an intense sourness, and it's commonly found in uh, Berliner Weiss, uh, the Flanders red and brown styles, Lambics, and occasionally some wit beers. Uh, Britannomyces is also very common. It's, it's actually becoming very popular today. Britannomyces is a type of uh, wild yeast, and it usually imparts um, a barnyard, a wet horse blanket, uh, damp hay, a goaty type of aroma, and it also contributes some sourness. Usually lacto and brett are used in uh, conjunction with each other, especially in your lambic styles. Um, we'll talk a little bit about gram-negative bacteria. Uh, gram-negative bacteria, the difference between gram-negative and gram-positive is negative usually has more robust cell walls. They're almost impenetrable. Um, they're not very alcohol tolerant at all and they tend to die off fairly early. Um, they're commonly found in many lambic bacteria cultures. You know, there's more than one, you know, there's more than just lacto and brett. There's other, if you get these um, lambic blends, they contain many different strains of uh, bacteria and wild yeast. And they contribute uh, many of the desirable flavors and aromas found in lambics. Uh, some examples are E. coli. Now, an interesting thing about E. coli is when we think of E. coli, we always think of what we read in the news about, you know, uh, contamination on vegetables from uh, fecal matter. And that is one type of, of E. coli. Um, most E. coli, though, is not harmful, and it uh, is found in many, many different things. Uh, can be far found in... Uh, various food types, uh, wild fermented foods. So E. coli is not always the bacteria that will make you sick. There are some strains that are very, will make you very sick, but um, not all of them. Citrobacter, Acetobacter, and Entrobacter, uh, most notably, are uh, found in lambic cultures. Gram-positive bacteria, uh, they have less robust cell walls. Um, this would be like uh, Pediococcus and Lactobacillus, our gram-positive bacteria. And um, they contribute sourness by um, the esterification of various alcohols um, to the corresponding carbolytic acids, thus generating that, that uh, lactic sourness. In, in, in some cases, they can also be responsible for producing a sweet, butterscotch buttery notes often associated with diacetyl so um, it can be very confusing I don't know many people that could probably tell the difference unless you're having um, say a, a wild fermented or a sour beer and and you're getting a little bit of that buttery or butterscotch note it, it may may or may not be diacetyl in those cases now we're going to cover uh, more on the fermentation process. We're going to cover the life cycle of yeast. We're going to go through a journey through fermentation. And we're going to cover the various phases of fermentation, such as the lag phase, the accelerating phase, or the low carousing phase, uh, the exponential phase, or the high carousing phase, the deceleration phase, the late carousing phase, uh, and the stationary phase. So we're going to cover those various phases, and we're just going to talk about what is happening to the yeast and to your beer during those uh, various phases. So during the lag phase, uh, the yeast are adapting to the environment. You've just this, the lag phase happens from the time you pitch your your yeast, um, usually for the first anywhere from six to twelve hours, uh, commonly. Anything longer than that, you're ending up with a longer longer lag time. Um, Anything longer than 48 hours, you can you can start getting into a little bit of a, a danger zone with your beer. You generally want it going before 24 hours for sure. Um, they start producing enzymes that they will need to help ferment the sugars. And if you remember from mashing, enzymes are nothing more than catalytic proteins. They're they're a catalyst for change. Is all that enzymes are. Um, so they start producing these enzymes. Um, within their cell walls that they're going to need to help uh, ferment these sugars. They assess the dissolved oxygen level. They assess the various sugars and the quantity of sugars and the amino acids that are in your wort. Uh, they import peptides and sugars uh, needed for cell division through the cell walls. 
the sugars that it's going to need, I think, is um, glucose is what it what it will be calling for during this phase. Long lag times can be a sign of problematic fermentations uh, ahead. Um, a long lag time could be the uh, the result of low pitching rates. You know, not enough yeast cells pitched. Uh, low dissolved oxygen levels. So remember the th um, three pillars of fermentation. I don't have all three listed here, but that's because the third one doesn't really impact lag time all that much unless you're in an, in an extreme low. Um, but the three pillars of fermentation are pitching rate, oxygen, and temperature. Those are your main three pillars. Any one of those three pillars breaks down the your whole fermentation can collapse. The leg phase is an aerobic stage, meaning that it requires oxygen. So lack of sufficient of sufficient oxygen can lead to excessively long laid times, stalled fermentation, and exceedingly high esters. You know, esters are produced when the yeast are stressed, and it's not always temperature that is stressing them out. It can be um, it can be an insufficient pitch. The next phase is the accelerating or the low carousing phase. During the accelerating during the accelerating phase, the yeast um, are starting to divide divide by budding. You know they're producing their daughter cells, and they they know how much sugar they have to consume. They know how many of their little neighbors are all around them and how many they're going to need. So they start to divide to consume all of this sugar. The rate of cell division uh, increases quite a bit during this phase. Uh, with proper uh, pitching temperatures, the yeast should only need to divide anywhere from one to three times. Um, that would be optimal, so you don't end up with a lot of mutation. This is also an aerobic stage, meaning it, it, that the yeast are consuming oxygen at this point. Uh, the oxygen is absorbed so the yeast can generate sterols, which is a key component in healthy cell, cell walls. Uh, cold troop can also uh, benefit uh, due to the fatty acids contained within the troop. Um, if enough yeast are pitched that no division needs to take place, if you're just pitching this massive starter, um, aeration of the wort is really unnecessary. Uh, so over pitching in conjunction with a very large pitch um, and aeration can be a concern because then you would have all of that oxygen that the yeast don't need to consume. So um, that's just something to be wary about if you are pitching, you know, just this big massive starter, or if you're pitching onto a yeast cake, uh, you may not necessarily need to do a lot of aeration. Yeast need oxygen to synthesize uh, the material for expanding cell walls, namely sterols and fatty acids. However, after the stage, the oxygen introduced to the beer will have a negative impact. Um, you can't really over aerate the liquid if you're pitching a normal standard pitching rate. You know, we're, we're talking where you're going to be running into problems is with a very large pitch where you're almost over pitching how many yeast cells you need to fully ferment your beer. That should be fairly rare. The exponential or high Krausen phase. Um, the yeast have fully adapted to their environment and they are actually um, fermenting the beer at this point. This is fermentation. Fermentation is nothing more than the transport of amino acids and sugars into the cell walls and this this um, is very active at this point. You would, This is your main fermentation phase. They are producing um, you know carbon dioxide and alcohol and other byproducts at this stage as they're trying to metabolize these sugars. This is an anaerobic stage meaning that you don't want any oxygen at this phase, all the yeast should have consumed all of your dissolved oxygen, so their byproducts are carbon dioxide and alcohol because there's no oxygen. Esters are also produced, and esters are formed by the esterification of fatty acids uh, by ethanol and the est esterification of higher alcohols. Just like with your bacteria, um, you know the the yeast are producing esters, and uh, to some point, you know they'll they'll clean up after themselves. Uh, if you give them enough time, they won't clean up all of the esters, but um, they will clean up some of what they produce. Uh, fusels are also uh, produced by the conversion of amino acids to these higher fusel alcohols.
In order to minimize esters and fusels, though, ensure that there's enough freely available nitrogen, which this isn't really something that we can control or we can look at with our, our brewing software. Um, but if you're if you're brewing um, all grain and you're, you've got a nice healthy mash, uh, your pH is, is decent, you're going to end up with... Um, enough freely available nitrogen in your beer. You're just going to probably run into this problem if you have a, a horribly high or low pH in your mash and you just have a really, really poor mash health. Um, also, ensure that wort is chilled to at least uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius for ales and 55 degrees or 14 degrees Celsius for lagers prior to pitching. Uh, Make sure that the wort is aerated prior to pitching, not pithing. So make sure uh, it's it's aerated well. And uh, make sure that the fermentation temperatures for that particular strain that you're using is not exceeded, and you should be just fine. During the deceleration phase, or the late Krausen phase, the growth rate has decreased significantly. If, if anything, it may even have stopped. Um, the ales will have metabolized all of the sugars uh, by the deceleration phase. Um, the lagers may still be working. Um, maybe they might reduce like by four gravity points per day. It is during the deceleration phase that you want to do the diacetyl rest. So you take your, your cooler lager, you know, say you're fermenting at like 46, 47, 48 degrees. Um, you've got some diacetyl in there from it's a natural byproduct of fermentation and the the yeast don't really re-metabolize that diacetyl at lower temperatures very efficiently so you got to get up to 60 degrees or more in order for the uh, for the yeast to re-metabolize that diacetyl so it's during this deceleration phase you raise the the temperature of your lager up to about 60 62 degrees and let it sit there for about four days and then from there you can slowly either slowly bring your uh, temperature down or if you're the type that wants to cold crash right after a diacetyl rest that's completely up to you um, I prefer to, to drop it down slowly to prevent the yeast from uh, dropping out and going to sleep until I'm ready to cold crash during the deceleration other fermentation byproducts are also metabolized the yeast are cleaning up after themselves you know they're you know getting rid of some of this diacetyl getting rid of some of the other uh, you know, acetaldehyde and all those other things that, that uh, they may have produced. So that's why racking your beer too early, you know, you're you're not seeing any signs of fermentation here at the deceleration phase, but the yeast are still working. They're working on, on cleaning up after their, their big feast. So this is why you don't want to rack too early. They're still cleaning up. Um, locker, lagers, um, just... Uh, to answer any questions anybody may have about off flavors or anything by by this stage lagers will not have any risk of producing off flavors most of your off flavors are produced during early fermentation this is late to almost no fermentation going on at this point um, so they're they're not consuming any sugars but they haven't dropped out yet that is this phase the stationary phase this is technically your lagering phase this is your storage phase there is zero yeast growth or development. Uh, the carousing falls. Uh, the yeast are flocculating. There's no more sugars to consume. They've re-metabolized all the byproducts around them. Their job is done. They're going to start to go dormant. Um, beer approaches terminal gravity. This is the perfect time to rack to a secondary if you are the type of brewer who wants to do one. Um, secondary is not necessarily... Uh, something you have to do, but some people still like to do them, and this is the stage where you want to rack to the secondary. Any earlier than this, you're risking uh, not having enough yeast to clean up the, after themselves. There may be some very small amount of trace sugars left, and that's completely normal. You want that sweetness uh, to help offset some of the bitterness and things like that. You're always going to have some residual sugars in your beer that the yeast couldn't consume. Uh, racking off the Trubin yeast will help prevent autolysis. This is old data, but I still think I need to mention it because it may be on the entrance exam. Um, so racking off the Trubin yeast will help prevent autolysis and off flavors because of reactions with Trub substrates. This has, over time now, been proven to be 
not a concern for home brewers at all. Um, autolysis, the way that um, autolysis works is autolysis is the breakdown of the yeast cell walls. So your yeast cell walls have to rupture and then the yeast has to decay. The only way that those yeast are going to rupture if they were relatively healthy is if they are um, crushed by pressure. And in the home brewing scale on, you know, anywhere from, you know, our five to 20 gallon scale, which is probably most common, there's not enough pressure uh, to crush those yeast cell walls. Autolysis is more of a concern for professional brewers where they're dealing with, you know, many, many barrels of beer in a fermenter in these, you know, in these giant conicals. So for home brewers, autolysis is not something you really have to worry about at all. Unless you're letting that beer sit on in the primary for like a year or more, but most people are transferring at some point. Uh, this is a very brief period for most ales. Uh, for lagers, this will be four, four to six weeks, up to six months. For ales, I mean, we're talking like maybe one to two weeks at the most. Um, during this stage, try not to drop temperatures more than five degrees per day to prevent early flocculation, unless you're 100% sure that, that you're actually really in the stationary phase and you want a cold crash. Uh, not a lot of people that I'm aware of are are doing traditional krausening or, or kegging, with, you know, with, where they are taking a portion of, um, they're taking their fully finished beer and they're adding about, uh, you know, maybe 20% or so of a young, unfinished beer to your finished beer in order to produce uh, carbon dioxide for um, bottling or kegging. This is an old way of um, of uh, carbonating. Now we just, many people are just adding, whether it be corn sugar or table sugar or honey or DME or whatever. Most people are doing it that way. They're not, they're not adding a proportion of young beer to finished beer. But if you are doing it during this, you'll take your beer from the stationary phase and you'll add uh 20% of, uh, of, um, unfinished beer to what is normally added. So here's a visual of the life cycle of the yeast. Um, here we have our lag phase and our acceleration phase. And here's our peak of fermentation. This is this is our <clears throat> excuse me. This is our high carousin phase. And the deceleration phase is going to be happening towards the end of this red zone as the, the yeast begin to decelerate. And then we have our stationary phase coming out here anywhere from you know we're still decelerating and then once we hit the very rock bottom that's our stationary phase you can tell which stages are um, anaerobic which is all the green so once you know fermentation all the way through is anaerobic you want no oxygen at any point except for during the stage where the yeast are adapting and dividing Controlling fermentation byproducts, esters. We've kind of already covered some of these. The yeast strain that you use is going to determine <clears throat> how susceptible to esters your beer is going to be. Various strains um, produce higher levels of esters. Fermentation temperature. The higher the temperature, the more esters you're going to get. Wort gravity. The hallmark esters of Belgian Trappist styles are not only due to the yeast strains, but also are a result of how those yeast, how those yeast strains um, interact with these very high gravity worts. Um, aeration, ester production, the ester production pathway directly uh, competes with the absorption of oxygen and metabolism into sterols. So very poor aeration is going to lead to higher esters. That's all you really need to take away from, from that. Uh, phenols. Uh, they're more common with wild yeast strains than with uh, yeast strains. But, um, you know, like the heffy, you know, produces, you know, that, that clove. That's a phenol. Um, if, undesired, if, um, if it's undesired and it's not an attribute of your natural yeast strain that you're using, you probably have a wild yeast um, infection or contamination. <clears throat> in beers like wheat beer, you can produce um, phenol-4-vinyl 
I can't pronounce that last word, but basically that you can produce the clove phenols by reducing the amount of the precursor amino acid um, by performing a protein rest at 111 degrees Fahrenheit. So what I'm seeing here is if you're doing a wheat beer and um, you want to control or you know minimize the amount of clove phenols. If you're one of the people like myself who does not care very much uh, for the clove, I like I like the clove um, phenol in my wheat beers to be very low. Uh, performing a protein rest will help um, you know reduce the precursor amino acid that is produced from that wheat beer um, yeast strain. So doing a protein rest will reduce the clove phenol. That's all you need to take away, I guess, from that statement. Fusel alcohols. Fusels are metabolized from amino acids and uh, production is increased as fermentation temperature increases. In other words, the hotter you're fermenting, the higher you're going to end up, the higher alcohols you're going to end up with. So you're going to end up with a uh, hot, solventy um, flavors and aromas in your beer. Uh, fusels also increase with work gravity, just like esters. There's nothing you can really do about that other than ensure that the rest of your environment is on point. You know, if you're going to end up with a high gravity wort and you're going to ferment very hot, you're going to end up with a very fusily solventy um, alcohol. Um, if you ferment that, uh, that high gravity wort at the lower end of that yeast strain that you're using, the lower end of the threshold, temperature threshold for that yeast, you're going to minimize the amount of fusels produced and you're, you're not going to end up with as hot of a um, high alcohol beer. Uh, some wild yeast, they don't produce ethanol. They'll produce some of these higher alcohols. So you'll, you could end up with a very fusel, fusely or solvent-like beer if you have uh, a wild yeast contamination. Diacetyl is a big concern for a lot of brewers. Uh, Diacetyl precursors are produced during uh, the yeast metabolism phases or, or during fermentation. There's nothing you can do about that. It just it happens. It's a natural byproduct of fermentation. Um, but they're not they're not the, the precursors are produced during the lag and low Krausen phases, but it's not converted to diacetyl until active fermentation. Again, you know, like I say, there's nothing that you can do about that except for ensure that your environment afterwards allows for the yeast to clean up after themselves. Um, more diacetyl is produced at higher temperatures and uh, sometimes if you are doing a late introduction of oxygen, which you really shouldn't be doing um, unless you're doing an extremely high gravity beer, um, some people will uh, blast it with oxygen in the beginning and then they'll wait four to six hours and they'll blast it with oxygen again to ensure that that the yeast will have enough oxygen during both um, phase early phases of fermentation before it hits active fermentation. Um, so you, you do run a little bit of a risk of over aerating during that say that late introduction and you could end up with more diacetyl. But be mindful that because um, a high fermentation temperature can increase uh, diacetyl production, uh, warmer uh, wort will also aid in the reduction of um, diacetyl. So a poor situation where you could end up with a, a high level of diacetyl is let's say you have a very warm uh, active fermentation and it's it's you know you, you you lose track of it you go down go downstairs you check on it you're fermenting at 82 you want it to be at 75 or lower and so you're fermenting very warm so you decide to cool that beer down so you cool you you have a very warm active fermentation and maybe fermentation was almost done and then you cool it down and now you have a cool stationary phase and deceleration phase where the yeast are wanting to reabsorb all that diacetyl but now you've cooled it down and they they don't metabolize diacetyl as efficiently at those cooler temperatures so in that type of situation you could end up with more diacetyl some strains are naturally more prone to diacetyl than others um, Diacetyl can only be removed by yeast, and uh, yeast convert diacetyl to flavorless butanidol. Um, keep beer on the yeast until uh, diacetyl is removed. If you're doing taste tests and you get like a buttery or slick feeling on the tongue, uh, you, chances are you have some diacetyl and just leave 
leave that beer alone for another week to two weeks let it let it clean up uh, early racking to the secondary can lead to more diacetyl because you're pulling the beer off of uh, its main uh, source of yeast and the fewer yeast and if you have very few yeast and high high level of diacetyl they may not be able to get it all cleaned up um, as we uh, mentioned earlier, gram-positive bacteria can also give uh, diacetyl impressions. This isn't really covered in the entrance exam or the um, or the judging exam at all, but I wanted to cover cover some uh, common temperature control methods, um, such as your your swamp cooler. Um, this is where you would just you can just put in uh, a some cool water you put in some ice um, frozen bottles of, of ice and you put a t-shirt over your over your uh, carboy and through evaporation you will cool uh, that beer down so if you uh, want to try to do a lager this way it's not a good way to to um, have a, a nice hold on your fermentation temperature but you can usually get you can get that beer down into the 40s using this method uh, you know, it may you may have a high fluctuation uh, between cycles of of adding the ice and things like that, but it works for some people. Here, I also have um, a heater. This is uh, a picture I took off the internet. This is very similar to what I do, except for I I have a pump that runs through my my conical. But if you look right here, you see there is a an aquarium heater. And that's heating this water. Let's say uh, this, you know, just for the sake of argument, this basement is uh, 60 degrees, and this brewer wants to to ferment at 70, or 72 degrees, or whatever. So he could put this um, aquarium heater, and it might have uh, it might have a thermostat on it where he can set this water temperature surrounding this beer to um, a specific uh, temperature, and it would be just like setting these carboys in a ambient room that has a has that temperature here we we're going to look at um, some methods of you know having a, a refrigerator where you can either cool your beer or you could even set it to warm and you are going to have a, a temperature controller hooked up to this refrigerator and in some cases, if you have a dual stage uh, temperature controller, which I'll show next, that you can do both warming and cooling. But for here, uh, we're looking at a carboy and a conical in a refrigerator. Here's the carboy and the conical, and they are going to be controlled by this uh, temperature controller. And this brewer can set this uh, controller plugged into his fridge at, say, 46 degrees, and now he can do lagers at a nice steady temperature in either one of these vessels and he doesn't have to worry about um, the beer getting too warm he doesn't have to worry about maintaining the ice um, jugs like he did in the swamp cooler method and if he's using this uh, as a heater he can connect a brew belt or um, say like even a, a, a seed heater to uh, the inside of this refrigerator and it will keep that refrigerator at say 70 degrees if it's in a co cooler environment. Some more advanced temperature control methods you have a dual stage uh, controller where you will have each of these each of these plugs you see will be one maybe one is plugged into like a, a light bulb and one into well this would be like a light bulb and then this would be plugged into the refrigerator and so the brewer can set a temperature um, in here or a temperature range and if if uh, the refrigerator gets too cool it'll kick in the heating side it'll turn on that light bulb which will heat um, the environment so that the, the beer will heat up and then if it gets too warm it'll kick on the cooling side and the refrigerator will start and it'll cool it down so you have this dual stage um, controller that can heat and cool and keep your keep your beer in a, a nice even temperature Next you have, this is my setup actually, this is my conical and I have the FTSS which here I have an aquarium heater in uh, this water. There's a pump and you have a dual stage 
it can either heat or cool. It can't do both at the same time, but you can set it to heating or cooling. And um, you set it at a specific temperature. And if you, in this case, if my beer gets too cool, there is a, there's a, a temperature probe that actually goes down into the beer. And then uh, the warm water will pump through this, this tube into a stainless coil that goes inside this, this uh, conical. And this coil goes up and down, up and down, up and down, almost like a wort chiller. And it comes out this side, and the warm water pumps back into the bucket. So it just circulates through, and it will keep keep this beer at this temperature. And my basement's always pretty cool, so I need to heat in order to get it up into the, the mid to upper 60s if I want to ferment there. If I want to cool it, all I really need to do is put uh, some ice in this bucket, and I'll be pumping cool water through if I want to do lagers. Now, if you want to get really high tech and advanced and spend, you know, well over a thousand dollars, you have a glycol cooled um, conical. Here's uh, the more beers example. You know, you've got the jacket around it. You've got the fans, fans blowing. You've got, you know, your glycol pumps and all that pumping through. And you know, if you really want to go high tech, that is the the cream of the crop, top of the line way to um, control your fermentation temperature. So that concludes uh, the ninth class here. If you have any questions, you can get my contact information from my website, www.barleypotmaker.info, or feel free to like me on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash barleypotmakerblog. I'll also do the best I can to answer any questions you have. Um, the next course, we're going to be covering uh, the basics of troubleshooting and uh, some of the, the more common faults, uh, what causes them, and how to correct them. And uh, after that, we should only have about one more class left, and that's going to be a recap of um, filling out judging score sheets.